Mataji is an incredible human being. At her age, she still gets up at 4.30 in, her mor in the morning. This really, you know, for us who are a little mm -hmm. bit younger, she's nearly 83. She gets up at 4.30 in the morning, meditates, wakes the people up at the ashram with a violin. Yeah, they're nodding because they were there. They were there. <laughs> She's a musician. She teaches at the school. She teaches children. She teaches Hatha Yoga workshops, meditation workshops. Um, she reads over lunch. She serves at guest services, so all the guests that come in and all the headaches that guests give. <laughs> she looks after them lovingly, making sure they're fine and well and that everything is organized. And uh, I, I remember when we were there for Saturday night satsang, after satsang, uh, Diani, one of our members, started singing. And Mataji, even though starting so early, joined us. And we were all <laughs> singing together and stayed on to party the yogic way. <laughs> and we had a beautiful time. So what more can I say about such a wonderful woman, except that I love her to bits because um, for me, she's so pure. She's what she is. There's no pretense. You know, there's total devotion. Um, when I went to her room and saw all the photographs on the wall of Gurudev and that total devotion and just do your job on earth and so practical. I think it's very important to be practical in this world and to meet somebody so highly spiritual and so worldly practical for me is, you know, such a wonderful thing. Such a wonderful day. So, Mataji, on behalf of all of us here, we welcome you, and we're so happy you've come all the way to be with us. Yeah. Thank you. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you so, so very, very much. I'm just, uh, I can't tell you how honored and happy I feel to be back again in, in Gibraltar with, with all of you. And it is something that... Uh, our topic for the talk that love is the answer. That's what I feel in Gibraltar. I really, really, really feel the love, the sincerity, and that's what life is all about. Real love. And when we say that love is the answer, we find that, that there are many, many qualities to that love. And that's what we'd like to play with tonight. To, to see, when we say love is the answer, it's not just the Valentine cut out. Because the physical heart is not, uh, is not really the seat of this love that we're talking about. The soul, the spirit, is the seat of this kind of love. That's the answer to everything. And that is what we want to develop. That is what we want to appreciate. And we thought, uh, because you love to sing, and in singing we thought we would play with a chant that I think you also know. Uh, it's a repeat. You know, it, uh, it's like a chant, and then you re-sing the other part. Uh, because I've heard you do the shambo. Yes, we've done it. Shambo. Yes, we've oh, done it. Shambo. You but not all of them. No, some haven't. But Mataji, they can learn. They can learn. It's, it's very they simple. They can learn. And uh, all you have to do is to chant back what I just chanted. And when it comes to Hari Om and Hari 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 Om, I, I didn't write that out every time because uh, that's easy to do. But otherwise, whatever I chant, you chant back. And that is a, a beautiful response to uh, what we would call a nice opening chant. And it includes the Hari Om. Hari Om is such a beautiful greeting because uh, in a way, it's like saying, I recognize God in you. I'm seeing that God in you. And I'm so happy. In, in, in English, we would say, praise the Lord, glory to God, thanks be to God. 
it's, it's that, uh, that's the feeling behind the Hario. It's that recognition of the divine presence everywhere. And when we acknowledge the divine, that's when we again show happiness and love to each other. Because if I just love you from your physical uh, beauty on the outside, that changes. Who of us is ever alike from minute to minute on that level? But when I love you for who you really are, that divine image, then that, see, that never changes. That is eternal in <coughs> you. That's who you really are that spark of the divine. And that's when I begin to really love you. I may not like what you're doing, but I love you. Did you get the difference? And only when we get to that depth of understanding do, do we start to really love each other. We accept each other just the way we are. And it is in that acceptance and love that transformation takes place. See? I don't know. Do you remember um, Monica, the mother of St. Augustine? For 30 some years she was praying for him and wishing he would grow up and be a man, do something with himself. She loved him so much and prayed for him so much. It took him 30 years to actually turn himself around. So you, you realize that real love doesn't give up. And that's the, the Acknowledgement that we give when we uh, we say "Hario." God bless you. Praise the Lord. That that's what we are really seeing in each other. So as we chant with the with this one, we we change the words so that it would uh, fit our talk tonight. That we are working with with love. So let's do it together. Shambo, Shambo, Sachida Nandaya, Sachida Nandaya, Hari O, Hari O, Hari 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 O, Hari 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 O, Shambo, Shambo, Sachida Nandaya, Sachida Nandaya. Hari 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 Om Hari Om 
in our own life, but it is that powerful all around. And you know, it is really an experience that you have to have. This is, this is another lesson in life. We, we think so many times, I want to learn something, I want to be something. And you want somebody else to sort of be it for you, be it with you, but you've got to do it yourself. I can have a dish of, of uh, well, let's see, what is your favorite dessert? Trifle. <laughs> Carrot cake. <laughs> Chocolate cake, huh? Carrot cake. College cake? No, carrot, <laughs> carrot, <laughs> carrot, carrot, oh, carrot cake. Oh, all right. I'm having, I'm having a carrot cake, and it's uh, my best friend is making this carrot cake, and I'm just telling you, I know that you love carrot cake. And I'm saying, oh, this is the best carrot cake I've ever had. I mean, it's so, uh, it's juicy, but not, you know, not too soft. And it's so flavorsome. It is unbelievable. And you say, yeah, I know. I know. I, that's my favorite cake, too. And, and you go along. I say, oh, but uh, I mean, this is really different. Uh, this chocolate cake and carrot cake. And oh, it's just, you can't believe. And then you'd say, yeah, I know. I'm, it's my favorite cake. I, I know how it is. I say, yeah, but this is different. What's happening? You have a taste and a, a perception of carrot cake that's yours. I have a taste and perception of carrot cake that's right there in my mouth right now. So I'm going to give you a piece of the carrot cake to taste. And you taste it and you say, oh. You have a new experience, right? This is a new experience. Are any two carrot cakes ever alike? Exactly alike? No. No, no it's impossible. So you could not possibly have absolutely known what this carrot cake tastes like because you have a general feeling of and experience of, of a carrot cake. Well, that's the experience each one of us has of life. You realize that? We each have exactly the same spirit. Exactly. We're, we're sparks of the divine. Each one of us. Not only each one of us, the entire creation is a manifestation of that, of that eternal energy, that cosmic energy. So on that level, we're all alike. We all have the same life force. But we have a body and a mind that's unique. No two alike. So naturally, the great Jesuit uh, Teilhard de Chardin said, you know what? We are all divine beings. That's that spark. Having a human experience. That's where we differ. 
And that's what makes life exciting. Because we have the same energy, but we have different bodies and different minds that want to use that. And that energy wants to use us as its instrument to manifest and to, to have an experience. So no two of us is ever, ever going to have exactly the same experience, even though we're in the same situation. We're going to perceive it differently, we're going to enjoy it differently, and we're going to remember it differently. Have you ever gone home from a talk and mentioned, I, I really, I just, this really touched me what they said, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and the other person is looking and says, when, when did they say that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. Oh, you didn't hear that. Well, what did you hear? And they say something and say, oh, yeah, I, I remember this, but it didn't, that didn't um, stay with me. And you realize you were both at the same talk. And how differently you remembered it and you went home with things that struck you. Life's journey is unique to each one of us. <coughs> so, what we, if we really want to uh, learn something about life, let's say you really love the stars. How would you how would you go about learning a little bit more about the stars? What would you get? Where would you go? Telescope. Where they have the telescope. Because then you could see it, you could feel like, uh, oh, I'm getting to, to know these stars and the planets. My goodness, they're finding new ones now. And they're finding new moons on the planets we already thought we knew about. Things never are the same. They're always growing. If you wanted to study more about molecules, what would you do? Get a microscope. microscope. You'd get the microscope. If you want to, if you want to get something with the ocean, what would you do? Jump in and get wet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, and you would feel the waves, and, and, and you would get knocked down, you would feel the power, and you, know, you want to experience it. You've got to do that with life. With life, you have to experience. What is it that you have to use as your media for experience in life? Love. Because that's the answer. And there's no end to the ways that you learn to love. There, there's just no end to it. Because you know love doesn't exist. Love doesn't exist. And then you say, well then, what do you call love? Ah, you know what you call love? The feeling that you experience when someone is kind to you, compassionate with you, honest with you, loyal to you, kind, thoughtful, caring and sharing with you, generous, grateful. The experience that you have when those qualities are being shown is what you call love. So when someone said, oh, oh, I want to take a picture and do it, been doing something, that's a picture of love. You say, no, that's a picture of generosity. Someone hugging and, and uh, holding someone who is, who is having a hard time, you say, oh, look, that's a picture of love. You say, no, that's a picture of compassion. Do you see? Mm -hmm. We. Sometimes we don't perceive what is love. It's not, uh, it's not just something out there somewhere. It's something very, very tender and something that you have to experience. And each one of us will experience love in different degrees and we'll experience in different ways. Some people show their love in ways that others wouldn't consider love. 
They don't, they don't feel it that way. But they feel, oh, this would be something this other person would really enjoy. And so in giving that, they are sharing and caring in a way that is their way of expressing love. Do you remember, how many of you saw The Fiddler on the Roof? Do you remember when, uh, I don't remember names, but when, uh, when the old Jewish husband comes home and, and uh, he asks his wife, do you love me? Do you love me? And she just looks shocked. She's been making supper. She just finished hanging out the laundry. <laughs> she, she, was, uh, she says, do I love you? Of course I love you. Haven't, haven't I made the meals, cleaned the house, uh, taken care of the children? And have, No, 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 no. Do you love me? Do you remember that little conversation in it? It was so tender, and yet at the same time, look at two absolutely different perceptions of love. And that, that uh, was such a human way of, of sharing that information. Of, how do, how do you understand and experience love? It was, it was beautiful. But you know what, what we have to do? The first thing we have to do is to love ourselves. To understand that eternal <coughs> presence of the Cosmic One inside of you. God dwells in you. And those of us that, that understand that indwelling presence of God through experience, you're, you're right away you say, oh my goodness, I, God dwells in me. But what are you saying to yourself? God dwells in me. So once I understand God dwells in me, and I realized other people have the same understanding. God dwells in them. What am I going to see when I look around? God's presence in everyone. Got it? That's not easy. That's love your neighbor as your capital S, as yourself. I'm beginning to see myself as the same self in you. So when I love you, I'm really seeing the self in you. So I love the God in you. And if I'm starting to see the God in everybody that's around and in all of creation, I see God where? Everywhere. Everywhere. We have a beautiful old gospel song that uh, does that. I, I don't know whether I sang it with you last year or not. I think we did. But, oh, I found God in myself. Yes, 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 yes. The second verse is, I found God in everyone. And the third verse is, I find God everywhere. So if you remember it, sing it from, from the first verse. Oh, I found God in myself. I found God in myself. And I love God fiercely. Oh, I love God fiercely. I found God in myself. In everyone. Oh, I found God in everyone.
that's the story. <laughs> and it being Ash Wednesday today, getting us getting us started into the Lenten period, what are we trying to do? Purify. Purify. Love purifies. Love is the answer. Love is the answer. And love burns every once in a while. It may even burn you to ash. <laughs> That's what you want to remember. You want to remember that. And if we understand that kind of love that gives, that sacrifices itself, that's what, what the real lover does. The real lover just gives. Gurudev mentioned, and I'm sure with Nalini you've talked about this so much in love, that, you know, the real lover just loves. Even if you say, well, I don't like you anymore. That's all right, honey. I still love you. But some people say, if you don't love me, you won't do this for me? Finished. I'm leaving. <laughs> That's business. That's what you call business. You won't sell this to me for ten dollars, that's all I have, I'm going. I just have ten dollars. So what you want to do, what you want to understand is that love, real love, is freely given. It's freely given. In all circumstances, when you really love, what you do never, never, never hurts anyone. You say, yes, it does. What they call tough love can really hurt, not in the same way as meanness does. Mm -hmm. Even if someone tells you something that in, oh, this really sort of hurts me, when you know it came to you because the person loves you, and wants to tell you something that, that would help you to grow, to be a better person. It's like pouring a, a, a little bit of, of um, beautiful olive oil over something. <laughs> it has that oil over it. It's not, it, it doesn't hurt so much. <laughs> yes, it, it was a strong thing to say. But because it comes from love, it makes all the difference in the world. That's why love purifies real love. And it's, uh, what you would say, eternal. It never changes. You know the old saying, there is faith, there is, what are the three virtues? Hope, Hope and then there is Charity or love. Well, you don't have to have faith in something that, that you have already. And you don't have to continue hope for something that you already have in your hand. But there's never an end to love. Love is, is boundless. And that is why it's always the answer. Do you see? It's always, always the answer. And you know, sometimes when we, we think about uh, growing in love, uh, you know when people talk about falling in love, Gurdjieff used to say, what, what, what is this, uh, what do you mean by this English statement, to fall in love? <laughs> Who wants to fall in love? Why not rise in love? Grow in love, not fall. <laughs> you, you, uh, when you hear that, you, you have to laugh. Why? Because it sounds funny when you take it the way it uh, literally expresses itself. And you say, yeah, that's true. Why, why do we say fall in love? Why don't we rise in love? so that our love grows and, and expresses itself more and more. That's a, a, a very wise thing. And you know what we find? That 
When we hear stories, we learn so much about ourselves. That's why you love to read. That's why you enjoy reading novels, mystery stories, and, and that's why you love to read the gospel too. Because you learn from the parables and you learn from, from beautiful stories things that uh, they were always there, but um, sometimes the story is pretty blunt. And if somebody were that blunt with you, you would feel it a little funny. But when you read it in a story, you, you can detach yourself a little bit, and you read that story, and you realize, oh, that's really interesting. That, that's a pretty important uh, truth. I'm going to work with that. So I've, I, I've gotten some stories. And I want you to, as you listen to the story, you, you realize you learn qualities <coughs> and you realize new ways of manifesting those qualities in your life. And when you want to manifest these beautiful qualities, you are really expressing the God in you. God dwells in you. And God is going to express itself, not he or she. God is infinitely <laughs> present everywhere, not just a, a one place. So God is spirit. God is spirit everywhere present. And God dwells in you as that life force. I, I don't know whether you've heard of uh, Julian, it's a she, but her name is Julian of Norwich. I don't know why Julian is, uh, sounds like a masculine name. But she was, uh, she was speaking with Christ. She was, she was a great mystic, a great mystic. And she was saying, you know, Lord, I find this so difficult to to understand how you dwell in me and in everyone and everywhere and everything. I just, I just, um, I, I, I want it more clear to me. In faith, yes, I, I know that's true, but I, I just can't, I can't get it. And he said, Julian, have you ever held an acorn in your hand? She said, yes, Lord, I've held an acorn in my hand. Did you know you were holding an oak tree? Mm -hmm. I never thought of that. I never thought of that. I'm holding an oak tree that oak tree is alive in that acorn, present in that acorn. But you know what? You have to prepare the soil, you have to plant it, water it, nourish it, tenderly take care of it, watch it sprout, Watch it slowly develop. Does it happen? You know the joke with the children when they plant something, they go out the next day and they <laughs> dig it up and look. Oh, nothing happened. <laughs> Stick it back in. <laughs> no. Uh, it's, it's going to take time. It's going to be weeks before you're going to have a sprout from an acorn that's been planted. And you know what? That's how virtues, gifts that we have. It takes time to develop spontaneously that quality of being positive. You wake up in the morning, good God, morning? Or, ha, huh, good morning, God. <laughs> <laughs> to 
two very different personalities. <laughs> and for someone to be always seeing the bright side at the same time realizes, my goodness, it's early, but good morning, God. Do you see? It's, it's an attitude that you have to really develop to see the goodness and the beauty around you. And that's the, what God was trying to have come clear to Julian. I'm present in you. I'm present in you. I'm the conscience in you. I'm the guide in you. This is pretty powerful. And so sometimes in the story, somebody would say, uh, Oh, how is it that, that I have been living all these years and, and I don't see that, I don't see that. I, I look at an acorn and I see an acorn, finished. I may step on it or it loses its little hat and, and I don't even pay attention, I kick it to the side. I, I, don't, I don't see something there. Maybe somebody says, well, you have to open your eyes to see. I do open my eyes, but I don't see that. How come? Well, to really see something, you've got to be there. You have to be present. Well, aren't I always present? No. <laughs> to see, you've got to be there. You have to be present. You're mostly somewhere else. What does that mean? How often, and just recently, I, I've been through this in real life. People come and they, they say, oh, I really need a job. And, you, and that's something I'm sure you realize here too, like in all over the world. Well, what, what kind of job are you looking for? Well, right now, I just really, anything would be good. But, uh, you know, I love to to be with people. I, I'd like to be a, a salesperson in, in one of those stores. <coughs> and I said, well, didn't you see the sign? I mean, they're, they're looking for people full time at Belk's. Very nice. What's the name of the be, really nice department store here? Double name. Oh, Marks and Spencer's. Marks and Spencers? Marks and Spencers. Mm -hmm. Belts is like that. <laughs> Big department store, very nice. <laughs> and they said, I said, they have a big sign uh, on the, in the front uh, window. I didn't see it. I said, you, you were at the Fashion Square Mall. How come? I, I mean, you went right by it. Well, I've got to go and look. I didn't see it. I, walk, I was walking right there on the, on the street. What does that prove? What is my my eyes were open, but my mind was someplace else, so I didn't see. I walked right by it. And we've, we realized that when we want to experience something, we have to be there. And unless you love, you're not there. The person that really loves is always present to you. That's why a really loving person is so thoughtful, compassionate, generous. Why? Because they're there in that present moment. They see what needs to be done and they do it spontaneously. And if they can't do it, they recognize that it needs to be done. They try to find somebody who will do it. And everybody else is just sitting around not even recognizing that that, that needs to be done. They're wonderful people, but their mind is someplace else, so they're not seeing that situation. Let's uh, have this little story. See whether you can figure out some of the qualities that different people in the story are putting out. The family is going to go to supper. 
they're out going to the restaurant, and they're sitting at the table, and the waitress comes around. And she's taken the order of the mother and the father. And then she uh, looks at the young boy next and said, Now, little fellow, what would you like to have for supper? And the little boy says, looks around his, his parents, you know, he said, I'd like to have a hot dog. He must have, forget it. He, he is going to get a, a roast and mashed potatoes and some carrots. And the, and the waitress doesn't pay attention. She says, and what would you like to have on your hot dog? Mustard or ketchup? <laughs> ketchup. <laughs> and the waitress says, coming up in a minute. And she walks off. And there's dead silence at the table. <laughs> And then the little boy looks up and he says, you know what? She thinks I'm real. <laughs> Isn't that pathetic at the same time precious? What are some qualities that you see in different people of that little story. Anybody? Yes, the mother's not respecting the little child's opinion, not even entertaining him with it. But she wants him to have good food, to grow strong, so she does care for him, but not recognizing that he is an individual in his place. It just the way, the way she carries out her comment. As soon as he gets that word out of out of his mouth, she's saying, "No, roast mashed potatoes, carrots, like uh, you know, this is how it goes." So the little boy is like, mm -hmm. "And what other quality did you notice?" What about the waitress? The waitress. Yeah, the waitress yeah. ignored her mother completely. Just had the boy. Very sure of myself. Giving some self assurance to the little boy and acts like he's an adult. Like he's alive. Mm -hmm. Here's another situation. Um, Mr. Melbourne just returned from uh, being away for several months, and his friend says, Oh, Mr. Melbourne, it's so wonderful to see you. You're looking so well. How and we're so happy that you're home. And, and he says, I'm, I'm happy to, it's so nice to, to meet you. Well, so how's the family? How are the children doing? Oh, they're fine. Uh, how old are they now? Oh, uh, well, the doctor is three and the lawyer is five. <laughs> how about that? Poor kids. <laughs> Poor kids. <laughs> How, uh, now if this came, not that he was laughing, it was like, um, oh yeah, the little doctor is three and the lawyer is five. Does that give you a tiny insight into what kind of, of uh, uh, planning is going on in this family? Uh, of what the children are going to do as they grow up. No, what they're supposed to do according to the father. If they do it, that's to be seen. <laughs> yes. But there are families, not so much now. You know, a story like that would be uh, a little bit longer ago. But uh, you can realize today in our adult life, we look at a situation like that and we would say, oh, what a shame. I mean, why don't you call them by their name? <laughs> you know, Jimmy is three and, and uh, Sally is five. It shows, I'm talking about them, it's again the same situation. Here's another story, see what you think. There's a older village man who 
is really trying so hard. This is somewhere in Asia. And he's really trying to uh, better himself and, and to be a, a deeply spiritual person and somebody who is growing. And he's, he's just almost giving up. He said, this is, is too much. I just, I just can't be like this all the time and, and I don't know what to do with myself. And so he runs to a monastery, bangs on the door, and finally someone answers and he says, I want to see the abbot. And so he takes him to, to the abbot and he starts crying. He says, sir, I, I don't know what to do with myself. I, I'm just a failure. I, nothing, I haven't been able to get anything done in my life. I, I'm yearning for, for growth and, and, and I just, I'm not, nothing's happening. Then the abbot looks at him and he says, ah, oh, sir, I just, isn't there anything that you can remember? That, that you've ever done in your life that has worked out? Where you were a success? Anything at all? Well, not really. Well, well, there's one thing, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the best chess player in our whole, in the whole uh, country where I'm from. Uh, but, but what's that? Immediately, the the abbot tells the, the monks around, I'd like two chairs, a table, and a chess set. <laughs> and then comes, puts, a, just looks around, gets an old monk, sit here, you sit there. Uh, I want the sharpest sword in the monastery brought. And then he looks at the villager and he said, Whoever loses this game, loses their head. <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the villager says, but sir, I mean, this, this old monk hasn't done anything. He's like, hush, start the game. So they start the game. And w within a pretty short time, it's, it's quite obvious that, that the, the villager is, is going to win this game. And he's, I mean, he's playing uh, against this stake of life or death. I mean, he, he's not fooling around. Every move is made with absolute precision, determination. And he looks up after making a, a move like this again, which is ensuring his <laughs> victory of the game. And he looks at the old monk, and the old monk is putting everything that he he knows he's not a professional chess player, but he's looking at everything so intent and, and making this a serious game. And he's making the move, and then Billy says, oh, this is terrible. This man has given his life for, the, for his people and for, to serve God. What have I done? This man is, is, is such a wonderful soul. Look, look how, how pure he is. Uh, what, am I, what, what am I doing? It's not his time to die. I, I'm not going to let this happen. I'm, I'm, I, I, I just, uh, I'm going to lose the game. I'm going to give my life in this situation. And so, he slowly makes uh, weak movements and the old monk makes his best attempts and all of a sudden the old monk is going to win the game, obviously. And the abbot comes and throws the table over and, and the whole chess game goes on the floor. And he says, young man, you have just shown the two most important and valuable qualities of one who is sure 
to have realization, enlightenment in this life. You have shown determination which was absolute. There was no doubt you were going to win this game and you didn't give up a move. But you showed absolute compassion in your life. You were ready to give up your life for someone else. These are the two most important qualities to show. Use them, son. You've reached, you've reached your goal in life, in this life. Always show determination to reach the goal, to stick with it, whatever you know. But always be compassionate. When you, when you hear a story like that, can you see anything in daily life? You know, there are times in daily life now when you see people, big organizations, businesses, and so on, buying up banks, buying up each other in order to have the, the most control, television stations, newspapers, magazines, all of this. They, they want the control of the whole thing. Is there any compassion in that? No compassion. Is there stick-to-itiveness there? Yes. But that's a lopsided growth, a lopsided personality. Do you see? Yes. You have to have determination. You, you have to uh, not give up until the goal is reached. But what's your goal? Is somebody going to get hurt by that? And are people really going to be benefited by this happening? No. So stop it. <laughs> stop it. Have your share, do as much good as you can with what you have, and don't push it to the point where others are crippled and, uh, in, in a sense, sort of bulldozed over. So you, you realize, thank you, dear, you realize that those two qualities are so important. Here's another story. Are the stories bothering you, or are you getting something? <laughs> there, was a, there was an accident. Uh, someone was thrown off their bicycle, uh, uh, they were, and they, they were brought over on the sidewalk. And this uh, lady walks over, and, and she bends over the the, uh, the person that's hurt in the crowd comes around, as you know, that will, right happen, will happen right away. And she's just uh, opening up the, the jacket and, and removing, because the, the person was really, that really hurt the arm. And uh, she was very tenderly turning the, and this young man comes over and, and sort of uh, pushes her aside. Excuse me, uh, I just finished the first aid course a little bit ago, I know what to do. And so she, she steps back and just watches. And all of a sudden she says, son, when you come to that page in the first aid book where it says, uh, uh, at this point, it would be best if you call the doctor. I'm already here. <laughs> what do you see? You're not being aware. Humility. 
You, you see, she could have said, uh, excuse me, sir, I'm a doctor. <laughs> she could have said that right away. She obviously could see that, that the person is not that badly hurt. Uh, well, let him, let him uh, do something. It's wonderful if you've taken a course. But she could also see that uh, he was coming to the page where it's time to call the doctor. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's very good. So you see the, the rashness, the brashness, when, when somebody is not able to recognize, uh, they don't know that much. There's the saying, how can I tell that I'm growing in, in my understanding, in wisdom? And the person says, well, when you realize today that you're not as wise as you thought you were yesterday. <laughs> you're wiser today. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? That's a very yeah. good one. <laughs> you still keep face. You haven't lost face in the situation, but you laugh at yourself. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, What's happening here? You've been on the beach, and you know that uh, many times uh, there are lifeguards, and then sometimes they even have a table that's set up for people that need maybe band-aids or, or something. There's a little health center. So uh, this lady is going to go on the beach with, uh, she has her little satchel, and it's her shift she's going to be on four to eight or whatever is the timing. <coughs> and she walks across a, a little grass uh, section on the, on the uh, edge of the, of the beach. She sees some bottles. And, and so uh, there's a little path in, in that grass. And so she puts her little first aid kit down and she goes over. She, somebody could step on that bottle and really uh, cut themselves. So she goes over and she picks up the bottles. And this older gentleman is walking on the path and looks over, huh, what is, she, what is she doing? And he trips on her little first aid bag on the path. He falls down and he really scrapes his knee and, and it's, he's really hurt. That's the story. What happened there? Lack of awareness. Was there any love there in the story? From anybody? Yes. When the woman was caring about yeah. the bus. So. Yes, she, first place, she's working at the beach. She is taking her talent and her skill, and she's giving of her time and everything. She's walking, and she's looking around, and she's observing that there's glass in the, in the grass there. And she's going to go over and pick up the grass so somebody does not step and hurt themselves. Up to that point, <clears throat> there is compassion, isn't it? There, there is love, there's consideration. But, what's the matter? Careless and careless. Can you also see killed the cat? Yeah. <laughs> Do you see, you, you have to be practical. If I leave my bag on the path, maybe she didn't see the man coming. That, that could be. But you don't put something down on a path if your concern is nobody to get hurt. Do you see? Mm -hmm. And there are times when we really have to be careful. We have to watch what's happening. And when people think that love is the answer, every stage has to be love. You can't have love here, love here, love here, thoughtless there. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. And you see how that word live in the present moment is so important. They're talking about that now. 
uh, live in the now. Uh, and that it goes and goes and goes. You read the Patanjali Sutras, you read the Gospel, you read all of these, and what are they telling you? Live in the present moment. You know the story of the of the ten wise virgins and those that weren't. They're going to go out into the forest uh, for some celebration. And the wise ones, what do they do? They take their lanterns and the wise ones fill them with oil. <laughs> they take extra oil with them, don't they? Because uh, it's dark and they don't know. Is this how, uh, lantern going to hold it? And what about the, the unwise ones, the foolish ones? What do they do? They expect the moon to shine the way. Uh, yeah, well, they, they fill their lantern, but, but they are expecting the wise ones, and they know they got extra oil, they're expecting them to share some of their oil if, if we run out. I, we don't have to take any. Uh, you know, they'll share. They get through the woods, close to the cabin where they're going for the, I think it's the wedding uh, celebration that they're going to, and the lanterns run out of oil. <clears throat> the wise ones fill the lantern because they don't know how long are they going to have to wait before the celebration starts. They want enough oil. So what do they tell the foolish ones? Go back and get some more oil. <laughs> we, we don't have enough for, for all of us. You say, ah, oh, that's pretty thoughtless. That's not kind. That's what happens when you are not careful in taking care of yourself when it is your privilege to take care of yourself. In fact, the fact that the wise one stopped and took extra oil is this absolutely present moment inspiration, don't go without some extra oil. And you refuse it. Have you ever been ready to leave the house and the reminder comes to you, oh, I wonder if I have, do I have the tickets for the show? Oh, well, naturally I have the tickets. <laughs> so what? So you walk out, take the cab, go to the theater, Oh, it's the wrong wallet. I have a different jacket on. Do you see? Your own conscience, the sweet little helper that you have. What did Jiminy Crickets tell Pinocchio? Always, always let your conscience be your guide. Yes, the guidance that comes now is check your ticket. Does it does it take too much time to to pull out and just be sure you have the ticket? No. So love, look at, look at, at in in such <laughs> gentle ways, that indwelling spirit in you is your conscience. And it, it tries to help you in all these little ways. And we always, oh, hush, I, I know better. After a while, it just whispers like this. Because you've told it to hush up so many times. <laughs> it, it doesn't come out with that clear warning. This is a, a funny story. The last one that we have, it's already getting late. But uh, this was at a UN meeting of several uh, delegates from different countries. And the American uh, delegate was sitting next to the Chinese delegate at the table. 
and they were eating and the speech was to be given after the meal. So uh, he was sitting there and he was just, you know, so what am I supposed to say to this person? So um, <laughs> he looks at him and he says, um, Likey soupy? <laughs> and the, the Chinese uh, delicate. And he says, Lucky drinky? <laughs> and when they were ready for the dessert and the the master of ceremonies introduced the speaker of the evening. The speaker of the evening is the Chinese gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> he stood up and he gave a talk, you know, indescribably clear and uh, not a mistake in English. I mean, the most intelligent speaker. <laughs> and so when he finishes down, uh, his talk and he's sitting down again, he looks at the American delegate and he says, Lucky speech. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it, in a way, what is it, in a sense, that real love always demonstrates? A sense of humor. <laughs> you know? A sense of humor. And that's something never, never, never lose a sense of humor. Because it, it's not always easy. It's not always easy. Can you imagine how he felt? <laughs> like a soupy and all of this. <laughs> So, you, you realize that a, a person of stature uh, is going to be able to take things like that and not take the insult, not take the, because there's a little compassion also that you show. You know, I mean, this man doesn't know who I am, doesn't know that I can speak English, He's never sat with me before. So, there's an understanding there, but still, uh, a certain wittiness that is there with a twinkle in the eye, <laughs> you know, a tit for tat, right? <laughs> and then, <laughs> yes. But that's life. And that's the spontaneity that comes to our life when we can show love. So, Every one of us has been given the great gift of life. But unless we do more with our life than just live, than just exist, we're in trouble. If you just live, it's the most boring existence. <laughs> totally boring. And if you look at the word live, if you turn the word totally around, you get the word what? Evil. 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 And there's also another word, if you play Scrabble enough, you would see in that word live another word which really tells you what the evil is many times. It's not evil that's going to send you to hell. It's the evils. These are the misunderstandings and the hidden difficulties that we see, obstacles that we can't recognize as challenges and we get knocked over by them. What's that other word that's there? Veils. <laughs> and we have to pull aside the veils before we can see 
the reality that is always there, but hidden by veils, <laughs> misunderstandings. You know the person who goes out and screams at night, there's a snake out there. And so somebody comes out with a big flashlight and goes out. It's a hose. The, the hose is rolled up there in the corner. I was just watering the lawn. It's not a snake. Misperception. <laughs> it's a <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Have you ever seen? I don't know. The, this, the another situation when you're going to visit your friend and you haven't been to their house before. Uh, they're, they just moved to a new place. And they have this beautiful uh, dog right there at the front door. When you open up the door, there's this dog that's just sitting there looking at you. I mean, it, you look at that dog and you think, if I take one more step, it's going to really come at me. So he said, John, could you come and get your dog? And John comes like, that's not a real dog. <laughs> it isn't. Oh, now what do you see? You see a statue of a dog. What did you see before? A real dog. A real dog. Now, what's going on? Go back to live. When we look at live, look how you spell it. L I V E. And you look at that I. Guru Dave had to give a talk once at a hospital on wellness. <coughs> so after this uh, beautiful introduction, finally he was able to speak. Uh, and he was sitting on a little platform there at a table, chalk and eraser, and a little blackboard behind him. And he wrote on the board, I plus Illness, L L N E S S equals illness. Illness. We plus illness equals wellness. And he turned around, put the chalk and the eraser back on the desk, and he said, thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed being with you for this talk. And he steps off the platform, you know, they were clapping, and, and he steps off the platform and acts like he's leaving. And said, no, tell us more. These are doctors. Can you imagine physicians and interns and all these people? And it was so precious. I mean, they, were, they were like kids. <laughs> and he started to laugh and he said, thank you so much. All right. So he turns, got, got back and sat down and he said, but you know, I said everything. When we are exclusive, I, me, my, we're sick. Okay. Mm -hmm. When we are inclusive, we, us, our, we're well. So you look at that I in live and you say, what can I do with it? Do you know, you know the story of the little boy who told his mother, Mom, you look at that full-legged man up there. And she said, darling, don't talk like that. Well, what am I supposed to say? Mother, uh, do you 
see the man walking there with his legs in parentheses? <laughs> yes. So you look at that eye and you realize if I would pull that eye apart a little bit, if I would start including instead of excluding, what would I form? Love. Love. I form an O. And if I become inclusive, my life would be filled with love. Do you see? That's the answer. And that comes with really living with your eyes open, and not only having your eyes open, but seeing. Do you see? Just because your eyes are open, you're not necessarily seeing anything. And that is what Gurudev meant by living in the golden present. That present moment. You know, when you, when you say things are golden, what do you really mean? Precious. It's the best that could be, do you see? It's beautiful. It's the best that could be. So that present moment is made beautiful when it's filled with love. That's really living in the present moment, loving. Let's wish that for the entire creation. You know the loka, or some of you do, and we'll say it in, chant it in Sanskrit and say it in English as we close. center of Gibraltar. Jai, Jai. 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 Jai to all of those of you who came, whether you're integral yogi students or not. Jai. 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 Thank you so much. Announce that uh, Beata's bought some cake, and guess what cake it is? Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's in the kitchen. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Beata. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Synchronicity. And I have a little, a, a little gift card for you that uh, has a beautiful saying on it from Gertie Day. And in a way, it really relates both to a teaching as well as it reminds you that you are the recipient of a random act of kindness. Pass it on. You don't have to pass the card around and take it away, but you want to pass on doing a nice deed, supporting something that you realize is really helpful, uh, doing your share to move the world into a greater level of love and peace. If you want peace, forget yourself. Think of the benefit of the others first. How can I serve you? How can I make you more comfortable? That's the way it should be. Giving brings harmony. Love and give. Love and give. Think of the other person first. With this kind of an attitude, the whole world will be a fantastic place. Sri Swami Satchitananda. This is like a, a, a beautiful <laughs> example. <laughs> a beautiful example.
example of Goethe's teachings, how universal they are, how inclusive they are, and how you practice what you teach. You practice what you teach. And that is why I, I am so thrilled to be able to give you, if you wish, uh, to give you one of these little cards because it's, it's a way of uh, continuing the work that you're doing here in Gibraltar in so many, many serviceful ways that you are serving and giving and supplying the, for the needs of people who are in, in dire need at time. Uh, it's so inspiring to see what, all what you're doing. And it's in the name of our beautiful teacher, yes. But at the same time, it's coming from your heart. <coughs> so, right. this please. This is the moment from our heart. <laughs> this oh. is from all of us to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is very, very meaningful to experience your love and your generosity and the sincerity that you have in your heart. Thank you so much.